This will be a review from class lecture. Looking at the P wave, it's 0.4 to 1.0 seconds, PR interval 0.12 to 0.20 seconds, QRS 0.06 to 0.10 seconds. QT interval is less than 0.40 seconds. T wave is 0.10 to 0.25 seconds or greater. The U wave is normally not determined unless it is abnormally tall and could mean hypokalemia, cardiomyopathy, or could occur after a patient received digitalis or quinidine. The P wave represents the depolarization of the atria. Atria depolarization is atrial contraction. The PR interval is the time period for the impulse to spread through the atria, the AV node, the bundle of his, and Purkinje fibers. QRS interval represents ventricular depolarization or ventricular contraction. If a patient's QRS interval is greater than 0.14 seconds, it could indicate that the conduction through the ventricular conduction system is prolonged. ST segment represents the time between ventricular depolarization and repolarization. T wave represents repolarization of the ventricles. QT interval represents the total time for depolarization and repolarization of the ventricles. Q waves. The Q wave is the first negative deflection following the P wave and should be narrow and short. Q waves often develop with ST segment elevation MI. Leads 2, 3, and AVF reflect the inferior area of the heart and the ST segment changes. Also, it could be mitral regurgitation. Lead 2 will best capture any electrocardiographic changes that indicate further damage to the myocardium. V3 and V4 are associated with cardiogenic shock. This is normal sinus rhythm. The S1 signifies the onset of ventricular systole. S2 signifies the onset of diastole. Sinus bradycardia. If experiencing symptomatic bradycardia, think about what are the treatment options. Atropine will increase the heart rate and conduction through the AV node. Treatment with a transcutaneous pacer would be appropriate. So how would you evaluate the effectiveness? Keep in mind that atropine increases electrical conduction, not cardiac contractility. So the quality of peripheral pulses is not used to evaluate the effectiveness of the drug. If you had a student who had a normal blood pressure and a negative health history but had bradycardia, would you be concerned? What would you do next? Well, for nurses, it's doing the additional assessment. So for more detailed information, ask about the family's health history. If this is an aerobically trained individual, sinus brady could be normal. Wouldn't necessarily need a cardiology referral. If a patient has sinus tachycardia, it may have multiple etiologies such as pain, dehydration, anxiety, or even myocardial ischemia. So further assessment would be needed before determining any treatment. Vagal stimulation or beta blocker may be used after further assessment of a patient. An electrical cardioversion is used for some tachydysrhythmias, but not for sinus tachycardia. This is atrial fibrillation. We think about what are they at risk for? Atrial fibrillation therapy that has persisted for more than 48 hours requires anticoagulant treatment for three weeks before attempting a cardioversion. This is done to prevent embolization of clots from the atria. Atrial flutter. Atrial flutter is usually regular, has a narrow QRS configuration, and has flutter waves present representing atrial activity. Radiofrequency catheter ablation therapy uses electrical energy to burn or ablate areas of the conduction system as definitive treatment of atrial flutter and tachydysrhythmias. For atrial flutter, it is used to restore normal sinus rhythm. Ventricular bigeminy describes a rhythm in which every other QRS complex is wide and bizarre looking. Pairs of wide QRS complex are described as ventricular couplets. Stress can bring occasional PVCs in a person, as well as overuse of caffeine. In a patient with a normal heart, occasional PVCs are a benign finding. The timing of PVCs suggests stress or caffeine or could be other possible etiological factors. Now if you look at this slide, the one on the top left is a bigeminal PVC. When you look at this, every other beat is a PVC. Top right is a trigeminal PVC because every third beat has a PVC. And then the bottom shows a couplet. This rhythm is a systole. This rhythm is ventricular tachycardia. The absence of P waves, the wide QRS, the rate greater than 150 beats a minute, and the regularity of the rhythm indicate ventricular tachycardia. This is different from sinus tachycardia as sinus tachycardia has P waves. 
A sustained ventricular tachycardia burst could indicate that the patient has significant ventricular irritability and antidysrhythmic medication administration would be needed to prevent further episodes. If there is a frequent firing of the implantable cardioverter defibrillator, that could indicate that the patient's ventricles are very irritable, and a priority would be to assess the patient and possibly administer amiodarone. This rhythm is supraventricular tachycardia. Ventricular fibrillation is irregular and does not have a consistent QRS duration. First degree heart block. Most of the time, first degree heart block is asymptomatic and requires ongoing monitoring because it may progress to more serious forms of heart block. The rate here is normal, so there's no indication that any atropine would be needed. If the PR interval continues to grow, then they may need to hold a scheduled beta blocker like metoprolol. Second degree heart block type 1, called also a Mobitz 1 or a Winky Buck. This is a disease of the electrical conduction system of the heart in which the PR interval has progressive prolongation until finally the atrial impulse is completely blocked and does not produce a QRS electrical impulse. Once the P wave is blocked and no QRS is generated, the cycle begins again with the prolongation of the PR interval. Second degree heart block type 2, this is known as a Mobitz 2. This is also a disease of the electrical conduction system of the heart. It is almost always a disease of the distal conduction system located in the ventricular portion of the myocardium. This should be treated with immediate transcutaneous pacing or transvenous pacing because there is a risk that the electrical impulses will not reach the ventricles and produce ventricular contraction. Second degree AV block type 2 is clinically significant for ACLS because this rhythm can rapidly progress to complete heart block. Keep in mind that if atropine is given for a second degree heart block type 2, it may put the patient in third degree heart block. Third degree heart block, also known as complete heart block. The inconsistency between the atrial and ventricular rates and the variable PR interval indicate that the rhythm is third degree AV block. A complete heart block occurs when the electrical impulse generated in the SA node in the atrium is not conducted to the ventricles. When the atrial impulse is blocked, an accessory pacemaker in the ventricles will typically activate a ventricular contraction. This accessory pacemaker impulse is called an escape rhythm. The PR interval will appear variable because there is no relationship between the P waves and the QRS complexes. This is a pulseless electrical activity. Performing a pulse check after a rhythm monitor check will ensure that you would identify a pulseless electrical activity in every situation. Any waveform without a pulse is pulseless electrical activity. This rhythm occurs when any heart rhythm that is observed on the ECG does not produce a pulse and it can come in different forms. Sinus rhythm, tachycardia, and bradycardia can all be seen with pulseless electrical activity. Pulseless electrical activity usually has an underlying treatable cause. The most common cause in emergency situations is hypovolemia. Cardioversion is a choice of therapy for hemodynamically unstable ventricular or supraventricular tachydysrhythmias. Synchronized circuit delivers a countershock on the R wave of the QRS complex of the ECG. Cardioversion may be done after several weeks of anticoagulation therapy. When a patient has a non-emergency cardioversion, sedation is used just before the procedure. The synchronizer switch is turned on for cardioversion, and the initial level of joules for cardioversion is low, around 50. Defibrillation is the most effective method of terminating ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Passage of the DC electrical shock through the heart to depolarize the cells of the myocardium to allow the SA node to resume the role of pacemaker. If the patient's rhythm and assessment indicate ventricular fibrillation and cardiac arrest, then the initial action should be to defibrillate. An embolectomy is removal of an embolus from an artery using a catheter. Preoperative interventions would be to obtain baseline vascular assessment administer anticoagulants and thrombolytics as prescribed, and maintain extremity in slightly dependent position. Postoperative interventions would be to instruct the patient about anticoagulant therapy and hazards associated with the medications. The vena cava filter is insertion of an intracaval filter that partially occludes the inferior vena cava and traps emboli to prevent pulmonary emboli. 
Ligation is suturing or placing clips on the inferior vena cava to prevent pulmonary emboli. Preoperative interventions would be when taking anticoagulants, consult with the healthcare provider regarding discontinuation of medication to prevent hemorrhage. Postoperative interventions would be to instruct the patient to make sure that they contact the caregiver if they have fever, chills, cough, or feel weak or achy, their skin is itchy, swollen, or has a rash, they feel faint, bandage becomes soaked with blood, the incision is swollen, red, pus coming from them, or it starts to come apart, if they feel lightheaded, trouble breathing, new sudden chest pain, and they may have more pain when they take deep breaths or cough, but especially if they start to cough up blood or their arm or leg feels warm, tender, and painful. Circulatory assist device decrease ventricular workload and increase myocardial perfusion and augment circulation. They decrease the cardiac work and improve oxygen perfusion when drug therapy fails. Provide interim support when left, right, or both ventricles require support while recovering from an injury such as a myocardial infarction. The heart requires surgical repair and the patient must be stabilized such as a ruptured septum or if the heart has failed and the patient needs cardiac transplant. Intra-aortic balloon pump provides temporary circulatory assistance by decreasing the aptaload and augments aortic diastolic pressure. The outcome is to improve coronary blood flow and improve perfusion of vital organs. It consists of a sausage-shaped balloon. It has a pump that inflates and deflates this balloon and a control panel for synchronizing balloon inflation with the cardiac cycle. The balloon is inserted percutaneously or surgically into the femoral artery. It is advanced toward the heart and positioned in the descending thoracic aorta just below the left subclavian artery and above the renal arteries. The intra-aortic balloon pump, during systole, the balloon is inflated, which facilitates ejection of the blood into the periphery. In early diastole, the balloon begins to inflate. In late diastole, the balloon is totally inflated, which augments aortic pressure and increases the coronary perfusion pressure with the end result of increased coronary and cerebral blood flow. Counterpulsation is timing of the balloon inflation is opposite to ventricular contraction. The intra-aortic balloon pump assist ratio is 1 to 1 in the acute phase of treatment. This means that there is one intra-aortic balloon pump cycle of inflation and deflation for every heartbeat. The action of the balloon pump can also cause physical destruction of platelets and thrombocytopenia. Peripheral nerve damage can occur, particularly when a cut down is performed for insertion. Patients receiving intra-aortic balloon pump therapy are prone to infection. Complications are mechanical complications, improper timing of balloon inflation, increase afterload, decreased cardiac output, myocardial ischemia, and increased myocardial oxygen demand. Mechanical complications are rare but may occur. If the balloon develops a leak, the pump will automatically stop. Signs of a leak include less effective augmentation, repeated alarms for gas loss, and blood backing up into the catheter. To decrease the risk of an intraaortic balloon pump therapy, obtain cardiovascular, neurovascular, and hemodynamic assessments every 15 to 60 minutes based on patient status. Keep the patient immobile and limited to sideline or supine position with head of the bed less than 45 degrees. The leg with the intraaortic balloon pump catheter must not be flexed at the hip to avoid kinking or dislodgement of the catheter. Biventricular assist device provides shorter and long-term support for a failing heart. It allows greater mobility than the intraaortic balloon pump. It is inserted into the path of flowing blood to augment or replace the action of the ventricle. The ventricular assist device can be implanted in the peritoneum or positioned externally and provide biventricular support. A typical ventricular assist device shuns blood from the left atrium or ventricle to the device and then to the aorta. Indications for therapy would be extension of cardiopulmonary bypass, failure to wean, postcardiotomy cardiogenic shock, a bridge to recovery or cardiac transplant, and patients with the New York Heart Association Classification 4 who have failed medical therapy. Preparation for discharge is complex and requires in-depth teaching about the device and support equipment, like battery chargers. Patients must have a competent caregiver present at all time. 
The goal is recovery through ventricular improvement or bridge to heart transplant or artificial heart implantation. Many patients will die or choose to terminate the device causing death and psychological support for patients and caregivers is essential.